Welcome to Epstein Becker Green's webinar, The Criminalization of Healthcare, the fourth installment in our White Collar Crash Course webinar series. We are pleased to have Epstein Becker Green's Jack Wenick, who is a member of the Healthcare and Life Science and Litigation Business Disputes Practices presenting today. Before we begin today's presentation, please be informed that today's webinar is being recorded and the participant phone lines are on mute throughout the program. You are welcome to submit questions directly to the presenter following the webinar, and contact information will be displayed at the end of the presentation. In approximately two to three business days following the webinar, we will communicate the availability of the webinar recording and access to the PowerPoint materials. At this time, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Jack. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, for taking a few minutes out of your day to participate in this. And I wanted to start by just noting very briefly that the environment that healthcare providers and folks like myself that defend healthcare providers is getting more and more dangerous in the sense that the government is focusing more and more attention on supposed fraud and abuse. And what's particularly concerning is that the criminal tool is being used increasingly in lieu of or in combination with the civil enforcement tools that we're all familiar with. And this is really an issue that's beyond Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative. You know, healthcare fraud enforcement has become a cash cow for the government, and it's not going to go away. And it's very concerning that we're seeing more and more of the use of criminal tools. So turning to the next slide here in my presentation, we see this dramatically through the announcement in 2014 by my former colleague, Leslie Caldwell, who was then the uh, criminal division chair at DOJ, that the government was going to be looking at each and every key TAM complaint for a potential criminal investigation or prosecution. Now, I assume virtually everyone listening to this knows what a key TAM complaint is, but just for the benefit of those who might not, we're talking about a civil false claim act complaint filed under seal by some sort of whistleblower alleging some sort of civil fraud against the government. And the notion that all of these complaints, all of these False Claims Act litigations are now being looked at to see whether they merit criminal prosecutions troubling on a number of levels, in my view. One is I think there's an ethical concern here. Virtually every state has a provision in the ethical rules for attorneys that you're not supposed to use the threat of a criminal prosecution to gain advantage in a civil case. Yet I can tell you from my anecdotal experience, this is precisely what's happening. In every instance, and I mean every instance that I've been involved with over the last several years, at least all the initial meetings that one has with the government in a False Claims Act case, there is also an AUSA, an assistant U.S. attorney from the criminal division sitting in on that meeting. And again, I find that troubling that the government now is using that leverage, if you will, of criminality and what used to be strictly civil litigation. The other troubling part is when you think about what a key TAM case is, is brought for some sort of whistleblower. Now, typically, these are disgruntled former employees who already have an ax to grind, but we're also seeing a new class of professional relators that candidly hop from healthcare organization to healthcare organization looking for information to be the basis of a key TAM. And the notion that this is going to be now a, a continuing source for criminal prosecutions uh, is very disturbing. The other potential for abuse here is, as we all know, civil key TAM complaints remain under seal till the government moves to unseal them, a process that could be years. If we're going to face the same situation with potential criminal indictments, it makes the defense challenge much more onerous because charges may not be revealed till years after they've been filed. And finally, I would just note that unlike in the civil context, in the criminal context, the odds of being suspended are dramatically increased because all one needs is a credible allegation of fraud, which is typically satisfied by their criminal complaint or an indictment. So moving on, um, the next question is, well, has the Trump administration changed anything? And while I haven't seen any formal pronouncement on this, I can tell you that everybody that I have heard speak on the matter, 
has reasserted that health care remains a major emphasis at the Department of Justice. And this is perhaps best reflected in the quote-unquote takedown that took place last July in which there was an enormous press conference of 412 individuals um, charged with various health care fraud offenses. These are actually all unrelated cases for the most part, but the fact that <coughs> the Justice Department chose to publicize them in this manner and link them sends a strong message that under Attorney General Sessions, criminal tools will be used, if not as much, even more so than before. And we're still seeing yet more health care fraud units. The latest one in the Chicago U.S. Attorney's Office now has a health care fraud unit. So we have two basic um, categories, if you will, of criminalization of health care. The first, as I've depicted in this slide, is the notion that substandard care uh, is, quote, worthless services, meriting not just a False Claims Act lawsuit, but a criminal prosecution for fraud. And you often see this in the long-term care context, um, and I put on the slide here the United States v. Hauser case, uh, which was interesting to me in that it was a health care um, nursing home operator who apparently was cutting corners and what have you um, and was charged under this worthless services theory. Interestingly, the appellate court focused more on were there instances where health care services were actually not provided at all but still billed for. But nevertheless, the point here is that the government is increasingly looking at the quality of services that are being provided and if they're substandard, making it into a criminal case. The second category of criminalization is this notion of medical necessity. And this is, I think, even more troubling than the criminalization of substandard care cases. Because what we have now is taking the basic rubric that only reasonable and necessary treatments are going to be compensated under federal health care programs, the government is now turning these into criminal cases. And what's problematic about this notion is that when we're talking about what's reasonable and necessary, it doesn't necessarily mean that something is clinically necessary in the sense that what the government's willing to pay for does not necessarily equate with some sort of fraud. For example, we have LCDs or NCDs, local and national coverage determinations. But those are just what the government's going to pay for. It doesn't mean what's medically or clinically appropriate. And these are often out of date as technology and knowledge progresses beyond which some bureaucrat establishes a standard for payment. The other point I want to make, moving on to the next slide, about the whole medical necessity issue is that we're looking at things after the fact. The government comes in post hoc, and after somebody's already been treated, the clinician has provided treatment, is now saying whatever it was, that diagnostic test, that treatment wasn't clinically necessary, wasn't medically necessary. And the problem, again, with that is, you know, what's reimbursable, what's paying, what qualifies for payment doesn't necessarily equate with what is clinically justified in a given circumstance. And you can analogize, certainly, to medical malpractice context, where anyone will tell you that a bad outcome doesn't necessarily mean medical malpractice. Similarly here, just because a provider has given a service or test or treatment that arguably may or may not be reimbursable, doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean it was criminal in that not being medically necessary. Now, some examples of this is depicted on the next slide um, is in the cases, which I call the stent cases, and I've listed a couple of them here. And what's happened in the United States versus Patel and McLean is the government has prosecuted these cardiology cases, arguing that the people involved didn't need the stents, the devices that expand an artery. And the problem with these cases, in my view, is that one, you're looking at two subjective determinations. One is, how blocked is that artery? Is it 50%, 60%, 70%, whatever? And different clinicians looking at the imaging studies could come to different conclusions. But moreover, even if one agreed on the amount of blockage, different clinicians are going to come to different conclusions as to whether a stent is justified. For example, if one has a family history of 
cardiovascular disease and other risk factors, you may want to put a stent in there with less blockage than in another person. And so the notion that these things are crossing the line to criminality is very, very troubling. Um, I put on the slide here the Apollos case, which was one example where at least one judge says, hey, we've gone too far. Just because a medical expert in hindsight says, I wouldn't have used a stent in this particular case, doesn't make it criminal. It's a question of clinical judgment. So the last topic I want to speak for a few minutes on about this criminalization is moving to the next slide, talking about the HIPAA subpoenas. And the grand jury subpoena in the healthcare context is now a vanishing breed. What we have instead now are these unique administrative subpoenas that we colloquially call HIPAA subpoenas that apply in the healthcare context. And it completely bypasses the grand jury process. There's no supervising judge. A U.S. attorney can simply sign it. You don't have any grand jury secrecy rules. You don't have to, like you would with a grand jury subpoena, designate someone a target or not. And the recipient of such a subpoena doesn't even know whether the case is really criminal or civil because the information gathered can be used in both types of cases. And moving to the next slide, this is precisely the problem with the HIPAA subpoena and blurring the line between civil and criminal cases. If you have a circumstance like we'd have in healthcare, where unlike the grand jury context, where there are very strict rules of what information can be shared on the civil or criminal side of the house, if you have a circumstance like we have in healthcare, where you could use the same tool, the same investigative tool, and readily share the information with both sides, why not have a criminal AUSA on every single healthcare case, which is what people like myself who practice healthcare defense are seeing. And then you're at their whim and mercy as to whether or not they're going to remove that criminal aspect of the case as you're negotiating. Some districts, I think, are better than others where it appears clearly early on that it's not a criminal case and the criminal AUSA drops out of the picture. In other cases, in my anecdotal experience, the criminal AUSA is always there, part of the negotiations in the same room with the civil AUSA, which I again say is, in my mind, creates a very, very problematic ethical situation, are using that threat of criminality to extort a higher False Claims Act settlement. And that is what we are seeing in practice. Every single case in healthcare will have a civil and criminal AUSA assigned, at least at the beginning of the case. And they're sharing information, they're attending all the meetings, and it puts healthcare entities that are the subject of these investigations in a very, very difficult position because you really can't have the same sort of conversation that you might in just a civil matter where you know a criminal AUSA is sitting in the same room. And so this blurring of the line between civil and criminal investigations in the healthcare context is creating a big problem. It's not changing with the change in Attorney General's office, the Attorney General, it's still going on with the Trump administration. And my concern is that we're going to see more and more criminal investigations of what 10, 15 years ago would have been strictly a Civil False Claims Act case. And that is why we here at EBG felt it was important to talk about this, quote, criminalization of healthcare, because it really is unique in the healthcare context that you're seeing this overuse of criminal prosecutors and criminal investigative techniques and tools in an area that in more recent years was strictly the subject of civil scrutiny. And thank you all for coming. As I was told, if you have any questions, feel, feel free to email us. I believe these slides um, will be available to you um, down the road. And thank you for attending today. And um, I look forward to hearing from any of you who would like further information. Thank you, Jack. This concludes today's webinar. As Jack mentioned, in approximately two to three business days, we will be emailing the, the availability of the webinar recording and access to the PowerPoint slides. Please join us next Tuesday for the final White Collar Crash Course webinar on signs that you may have a problem presented by Richard Westling.
and thank you for joining us.